Bonjour. Bienvenue, Annie. My name is Melanie Dixon, and I'm a registered early childhood educator and director of professional practice here at the College of Early Childhood Educators. I'd like to welcome you to uh, an introduction to the CPL portfolio. Uh, the uh, presentation uh, will uh, include uh, a brief overview of the updated code of ethics and standards of practice, and then we'll move into um, the CPL program, and in particular, focus on the portfolio cycle. I'd like to highlight for you to the right of your screen, you can see uh, we've provided a direct link to the Code of Ethics and Standards of Practice, as well as a direct link to the CPL page, where you can go and find many of the uh, resources, uh, diagrams that I'm going to uh, share with you uh, today. So let's look at the standards. Uh, this past July uh, 2017, uh, we saw the uh, uh, enforcement of our second edition of the Code of Ethics and Standards of Practice. Now, ethical and professional standards are required for any regulated profession. And so what these do for us as uh, professionals in early childhood education is they expand on the scope of practice, which is actually defined in our legislation in the Early Childhood Educators Act. And uh, so they provide uh, uh, an outline for members. Uh, they are meant to guide members in their practice, uh, their conduct, and um, they highlight what knowledge is required what does uh, what might someone observe in practice in terms of skills, uh, behaviors, etc. And uh, they also embed the um, values of the profession as well. And in essence, highlight at a high level the key responsibilities of early childhood educators. So again, they're meant to be used by the uh, profession itself, which uh, currently stands at about 52,000 uh, current members. We're about the sixth or seventh largest regulated profession in Ontario, and there are over 40 regulated professions, just to give you a little bit of a scope. These standards are also used by the Complaints Committee and the Discipline Committee uh, when they're considering uh, cases that are before them as well. So what are some of the uh, highlights of the, this new new edition, the, the 2017 version of the Code and Standards? The Code of Ethics, in, in essence, has the same sort of layout in terms of uh, core responsibilities to children, families, colleagues, the profession, uh, communities, and, and the public. Um, but uh, where, where members and uh, employers, uh, et cetera, will notice a, a, a change from our, our initial uh, code and standards are that each of these six standards is, uh, first of all, there are three sections to each standard. Now we have a principal section which outlines what are the, uh, the core elements behind that one standard. We have a knowledge section. So what do registered early childhood educators need to know? And a practice section. So what might be demonstrated through practice um, and through uh, behaviors, uh, skills, et cetera, et cetera, demonstrated by early childhood educators. There are uh, a few changes in terms of um, one key change and uh, a key change that council in particular uh, and um, the staff here at the college are excited about and I know that many um, early childhood educators out practicing the profession were excited to see the fact that we renamed standard four to be called professionalism and leadership and what is a uh, key there in in that principle is that uh, all RECEs are viewed as leaders regardless of position or title. These standards also place a greater emphasis or provide a little bit more around the framework of, uh, in terms of relationships, uh, communication and collaboration, 
to be in line with some of the current uh, policy directions in the province. Uh, we'll see reference to well-being as well. And um, we've expanded on standard three around the learning environments and standard two around pedagogy as well. Now, considering we are in the uh, 21st century, uh, we've uh, addressed um, through standard two, we have a, uh, a standard that uh, re um, references uh, the use of technology and um, a couple areas in the standards where you'll find reference to social media as well. And for uh, members, uh, an area that um, uh, members were looking uh, for further clarity. We have uh, expanded on the area around dual relationships in Standard 5. And to uh, further uh, assist with some reflection and uh, discussion around dual relationships, we have uh, also published a practice guideline on dual relationships. A practice guideline basically um, uh, picks on an area or, or highlights a, a, an area of the code and standards and provide to provide further guidance and uh, reflection and uh, opportunities for discussion around that topic area. Another practice guideline that we have, a very important one, is called uh, supporting positive interactions with children. So as we go into our theme of continuous professional learning, which is an expectation um, of all professionals, uh, when you go to see your family doctor, you have, um, there is a, a trust, um, an assumption there that your doctor is staying current in terms of medical practice and that they're going to be able to provide you with um, the latest in terms of, of medical care or know where to refer you, uh, et cetera. So the same as, as a regulated profession, early childhood educators, the, the, the um, public has the same expectation of us that we are going to continue our learning. And so you'll find reference to that uh, in our code of ethics and standards of practice as well. And that just, again, further supports the regulation around continuous professional learning. But standard four in particular uh, states that RECEs review and access current research and transfer this knowledge into evidence-informed practice. Uh, you engage in critical reflection, collaborative inquiry, and demonstrate a commitment to ongoing learning by engaging in the continuous professional learning program. So we're going to uh, step into that realm now. And so, again, as I mentioned earlier, the public has a, um, an expectation that a profession is going to continue their learning. The profession itself, um, if we are indeed a profession, which we have been recognized in law as being a, a profession, so we are professionalisms, and a core concept behind um, we are professionals, sorry, and a core concept behind professionalism is ongoing learning. So uh, our learning uh, did, did not end, nor does it end for, for those new grads um, after our initial uh, education and training as early childhood educators. We must uh, continue to maintain and update our skills and knowledge and live the values of the profession um, through ongoing learning. And, and so while, again, the majority of members were doing this anyways, the, the, the difference or the distinction is that um, as a professional, it's something that you're being really intentional about. You're being uh, systematic around how are you planning for this, according to the code and standards, uh, ensuring that you're planning your learning to uh, best meet the code and standards, and um, uh, again, expanding on, on those skills as the profession evolves. And we know that there have been a lot of changes just even in the last five years. We could go back 10 years, 15 years, and what we've learned around child development and uh, the legislation and policy changes that have uh, have occurred in our sector 
there's been plenty uh, opportunity and continues to be a lot of opportunity for us to continue our learning. So we uh, now have a continuous professional learning regulation that falls out of the Early Childhood Educators Act. And um, the official document that you can find online um, that sort of spells out what at this time do members of the college need to do to, um, uh, to maintain their uh, ongoing uh, learning requirements. That's spelled out in the notice of CPL program requirements and that is available online. Uh, should council determine that uh, updates are required uh, to the CPL program that we, we make some changes as the years go on, uh, members would be notified and it would be through uh, the notice of CPL program requirements. And so they spell out what are the, uh, the expectations in terms of timelines, what needs to be done and how often, what records need to be kept, and what are some of the consequences for non-compliance. This sort of highlights, um, in the case of those of us who were already members in September of 2016, uh, when this mandatory CPL program began, this sort of uh, highlights the first three years of this implementation phase. So the first uh, column or the blue box is uh, completing the expectations for practice module, and the next two represent the first two-year portfolio cycle that uh, some of our members as of September 2017 have started to embark on and uh, that will be part of our journey journey this year. Uh, those two boxes, those get rinsed and I say rinsed and repeated. Uh, we will do a new two-year cycle in another uh, two-year uh, time. Again, this is all dependent on when you become a member uh, and your, your renewal dates. So uh, this also represents what a new member, someone new coming into the profession, their first year will be to do the expectations for practice module. And then uh, after their first renewals, when they'll start their CPL portfolio cycle. This is available uh, online as well as in the CPL portfolio handbook. This chart is also available online and we do have a verse. So this is for those of us who have already begun our engagement in the CPL program, um, effective uh, when it started in uh, September of 2016. For any new members joining the college, we have a new, uh, new to the college or new to CPL uh, section on our website for to, to check out and see where you, your, you fit in, that, in the cycle. But for those of us who were members, um, uh, uh, as, as of September 16th, uh, 2016, uh, sorry, September 2016, uh, basically what you're doing is you're finding your renewal month. So, uh, for example, anyone who uh, renews in, renewed in October and they were a member um, uh, over a year ago, they should have completed their, C their uh, expectations for practice module and then um, now they should be in the process of starting their CPL portfolio cycle. For those of you who renew in April, May, or June, uh, you still have until then to do your expectations for practice module, and it will be at that point that you'll begin the uh, CPL portfolio cycle. A couple things that will help uh, help you with uh, knowing when to start. One is when you go to renew. Um, uh, for those September 2017 and onward, um, you'll note that our uh, renewal form has changed and one of the sections, I believe it is section six, is around confirming uh, participation in the CPL program and so that's where you'll confirm that you've done the expectations for practice module and then you'll begin the CPL portfolio cycle. The month of your renewal you will get in the mail the CPL portfolio handbook. So for those of you who have already renewed this year 2017, September, October, November, 
you should have received your CPL portfolio handbook by now. If your renew if your renewal month is December, it will be uh, the handbooks will be sent out to that group who renew in December. Um, it will be sent out at the beginning of the month. And the same is true for those of you who don't renew until later in the winter, spring, or summer. So ultimately, the CPL portfolio cycle, it is a, a self-reflective uh, process. It is also framed in self-directed learning. So through that self-reflection, uh, we, uh, in particular through the self-assessment tool, that's an opportunity for you to be thinking about, okay, what's what's going on for me in my practice right now? What am I anticipating for the future? What do my what might my goals be, and what activities can I uh, will I do to meet those goals? The college is not directing you to take a certain number of hours, nor are we telling you that you need to take course A, B, C. It is based on your self-assessment of your current practice needs and um, how you would like to meet those uh, three, three goals um, over the next two years. And we have um, this one of the resources that I'll be uh, sharing with you uh, today is that we have a document, it's called Reflective Practice and Self-Directed Learning, and this could be a good uh, resource for you to consider to understand um, impart the framework of, of the program as well as have some further uh, discussion and uh, opportunity for reflection with uh, colleagues as well. So the CPL portfolio handbook as I said will be mailed to you the month of your renewal. We have included in the appendix at the end of the uh, handbook the three components that are required to be completed um, for the CPL portfolio cycle. And uh, please know that, as I mentioned earlier, all of these documents are available online. So the three tools or components of the CPL uh, program are available online and you can download them and complete them that way. I do know in speaking to um, a member recently to understand a little bit about her process, uh, she said that she had used and kept handy the handbook for about a one to two week period of time. And as thoughts arose, she jotted them down in the self-assessment uh, area. And then uh, later on in her professional learning plan, some ideas um, that were coming to mind. And then she sat down and um, opted to enter in a more of a formal way in the electronic version. But she kept that handy, the handbook handy, to make notes either at work or at home <coughs> as thoughts emerged. All right, so what's the purpose of the CPL portfolio cycle? Well, it is really to ensure that members are reflecting on their practice, that they're planning their learning according to what their practice needs might be or interests, and that uh, they're documenting their learning experiences. And so the portfolio aims, again, to help facilitate uh, self-reflection around this process, um, uh, provide a, a practical uh, way of determining what those professional learning goals are going to be and um, uh, documenting what are some of the activities that the member would like to do to meet those goals. And really, uh, fundamentally, they're meant to support members in uh, being able to uh, practice and conduct themselves according to the code and standards and to plan their learning accordingly as well. And really, ultimately, it's to help improve uh, professional practice. So I'm just going to uh, share a video with you now.
Ongoing learning is important for registered early childhood educators and a great way to stay current in your practice as it evolves. That's why you are now required to participate in the continuous professional learning portfolio cycle. Your CPL portfolio cycle begins the month of your renewal. To get started, read your copy of the CPL Portfolio Cycle Handbook. It will help guide you through the program's three components, beginning with the self-assessment tool. The first component of the portfolio is designed to promote reflection, brainstorming and decision-making. You'll be asked to think about things like your role and responsibilities, your ongoing concerns or questions, and to consider new opportunities and challenges. Plus, it's also a great way for you to review the code of ethics and standards of practice and reflect on your strengths and areas for growth. Through this guided self-reflection, you will identify three priority goals to set for yourself for this portfolio cycle. Then, just like that, you're on to the next step, the professional learning plan. Use the chart and add the three goals you outlined in the self-assessment tool. Then, write down the learning activities you'd like to do to meet your goals. Flip to pages 10 and 11 in the handbook and you'll find a suggested timeline for completing the components. You can participate in an independent study, plan professional discussions, or job shadow a colleague. And for more ideas, check out the activities web on page 16. The final component of the portfolio is to complete your record of professional learning by writing a short description of your activities to document your learning. Don't forget to list any discussion notes, certificates, or samples of articles read or written that show your participation. And finally, explain how you plan to integrate what you've learned into your professional practice. RECEs can complete the components electronically or save a paper copy and are required to keep all documentation for six years. Once you've completed your two-year portfolio cycle, it's time to begin again, but let's go over the components one more time. First, read your copy of the handbook. Then, complete the self-assessment tool and set three goals for yourself. Use these goals to create your professional learning plan. As you complete your activities to achieve your learning goals, fill out your record of professional learning. And that's it! For more information and to view example CPL portfolios, use the links below. All right, so you can find this uh, brief video, which provides a very uh, high-level overview of the CPL portfolio process. It is available on our website. This um, uh, flow chart you also saw in the video, it's available in the CPL portfolio handbook, but really what it's demonstrating is that this is a cyclical process uh, around self-assessing, what are the needs, interests, uh, considerations for future leadership development, and uh, planning, uh, creating some goals, planning uh, activities to meet those goals, doing uh, the activities, documenting the learning, and, and how uh, you will apply that in practice. And then, as I mentioned earlier, a rinse and repeat. So the first, um, first part of the portfolio cycle, uh, this is done every two years. Uh, you'll see in uh, doing the self-assessment, there is a, a component that is um, uh, where you're going over through the uh, Code of Ethics and Standards of Practice. And it really is about reflecting on, on your current practice, what's happened in the recent past, what you're envis envisioning for the future to uh, uh, allow for some decision making as to what are your top three priorities. And uh, those three priorities get transferred into three concrete goals for yourself. Second uh, component is the plan. And so from your self-assessment, you transfer over those uh, three goals and determine what are some of the activities that you might do to meet those goals and create also some timelines for yourself around uh, when you believe those activities might be done or completed. You'll find the CPL activities web in the um, uh, portfolio handbook as well as on the website. And this, again, while, while it is really offering some interesting uh, 
uh, opportunities for, for members to think more broadly about how to, to go about their professional learning. I think it will be challenging to think and go beyond what we view as traditional professional uh, development or learning uh, about attending workshops and conferences and, and taking courses. But there are a lot of things that you can do in the context of your, your uh, daily practice. And so to be thinking, what can you do um, within the context of your workplace, of context of your practice, and what can you do in the context of working with others as well? The Record of Professional Learning is the third component and that is completed as you go along and complete activities, document what you did, when you did it, as well as what was some of the learning that you took away from that and how might you ap apply that into practice or potentially um, uh, how that might encourage a future learning. Some examples of documentation that you might include in your record of professional learning are a list of the publications and online resources that you've read. Uh, if you're uh, participating in any study groups or leading any study groups, um, provide some summaries from those. Any certificates, receipts, agendas uh, from more uh, formal type of uh, situations that you um, might have attended. Uh, descriptions of podcasts or webinars that you've participated in, uh, slides or the handouts from presentations, samples of your own work, uh, be it perhaps if you've written an article for a parent newsletter or created or worked on um, a, a new workplace policy, uh, etc. Perhaps it's a journal and uh, some of the reflections focused in on a, a particular area uh, around one of your goals, any research or um, active uh, research or active learning that you've done, and um, any contributions that you may have done through sitting on committees or networks uh, or that type of thing. So these are examples of documentation or evidence that you might provide. Uh, and um, that you would uh, keep along with your portfolio. So just in terms of compliance, um, I have I used the phrase to complete is to comply. As I mentioned, there are three components to the CPL portfolio cycle, the self-assessment tool, the, the uh, professional learning plan, and the record of professional learning. Completing those three components is what is required. So, um, and that's what you need to maintain as along with the evidence or supporting documentation uh, with your record of professional learning. It is an honor-based system. Um, we uh, are not in a position to receive 52,000 portfolios. So you will confirm that you've done the step that is required um, for you in any given uh, year um, when you go to renew. So it is based on a declaration when you uh, complete your renewal form. A reminder to you that that renewal form is an official document and you are signing off and agreeing to the fact that the information you're providing is true and verifiable. So um, please do uh, keep that in mind as you're completing the confirmation. And the uh, college does have uh, uh, the authority to audit member records, so we could request your uh, CPL portfolio handbook, and you are required to uh, keep your CPL portfolio documentation uh, for up to six years. That documentation could be uh, paper-based, electronic, or a hybrid of the two, as long as you are able to provide us with uh, the paper or electronic documents um, uh, should the college request them. And uh, where a member is not um, uh, complying with the requirements of the program, that could uh, lead to a suspension of a member's certificate of registration, which means that they uh, would not be able to use the title nor work in the scope of practice um, of an early childhood educator. So that in particular impacts members who are working in uh, uh, licensed childcare as well as in the kindergarten program. 
and any other environments where registration with the college is required. So here's an example. Uh, we've got uh, Lee's uh, uh, CPL portfolio. What I'll invite you to do is if you're watching it either on your own or, or as a group is to um, pause between the, um, the slides to have uh, some uh, small group or large group um, discussion around some sharing your ideas. But Lee is an REC who's been working with toddlers for um, 15 years. And so here's a snapshot of her uh, portfolio. So in terms of the self-assessment tool, one of the three priorities that she identified was communication with families and colleagues about child development and inquiry and play-based learning. So the standard that we've highlighted for you in this case, for this example, is standard 4C2. It says that RECEs effectively communicate the foundations of their practice and their decision-making processes to families and colleagues. There are other standards that fit with uh, Lee's uh, professional learning por uh, priority, and she would identify those in her self-assessment uh, tool. However, for this purpose, uh, due to space, practicalities of space, we've included this one standard, but the standards are integrated and there are often times there will be definitely more than one standard that might apply to one of your priority areas. So she's translated this into her goal as uh, being um, to assume a leadership role and improve communication with families and colleagues about inquiry and play-based learning and child development. Now this goal is still quite broad. Uh, if you gave this goal or if you had five RECEs who, who, who um, took on a goal similar to this, you'd have five different ways of um, making this goal happen through the various activities. Um, you could get more specific around this goal as well. It really is um, up to the member to determine um, uh, how they might proceed in, um, in demonstrating or writing up their professional learning goal. This is one example. So as a group or in small groups, you can take a moment now to think about what might be some activities that Lee could do to meet this professional learning goal? So we've highlighted a couple key activities that Lee would do over the two year period of time related to this one goal. One is to connect with her colleagues and set up regular study groups focused on communication strategies and information sharing with families. She's going to lead the discussion for the first couple study groups, but then she's going to invite her colleagues to take turns, uh, perhaps finding uh, something, an article or a resource of interest and lead the study groups. So here's where she's uh, taking on a leadership role, but she's also going to be encouraging uh, leadership development in uh, with her colleagues. Another key activity around this one goal is to facilitate two family curriculum nights for the center. She's gonna collaborate with colleagues, but again, she'll take the lead on communicating with parents, on leading the discussion and providing the handouts. So Lee has a lot of experience. She's been working with uh, uh, toddlers for uh, 15 years. So she's ready to embrace this uh, leadership role and to also help um, uh, her colleagues um, taking on uh, some, some leadership as well. Remember this one goal uh, for one person you know, maybe this is not where they're at. This is where Lee's at based on her career. And it also is a reflection of activities that she would do over a two year period of time. Her other two goals could look very different um, and not uh, be a little bit more um, self-reflective and in, in nature and personal in nature rather than um, uh, taking on uh, facilitation at this level, for example. 
So what I uh, might propose that you do again in small groups or as a large group is to think about what might be some of the evidence or documentation that Lee would include in her portfolio um, for in her record of professional learning. So you can take a moment to uh, think about that or discuss uh, some ideas there. So over the uh, two year period, um, Lee collected some of the notes from her study groups. Uh, she uh, shared, um, she has an electronic file of the handouts that she shared uh, with the parents on the curriculum nights. And she actually asked a colleague to record, a video record her leading the, um, the discussion with the parents. Now, just something to keep in mind is that uh, to, when you're uh, maintaining documentation is to think about the confidentiality aspects side of things and to ensure that um, uh, you're respecting any uh, um, uh, requirements, uh, legislation and policies around, uh, around that. Um, there is a way that her colleagues could uh, record her without actually recording the parents and ensuring the parents are okay that um, that there's that they've signed off on her recording uh, the session as well. And she's listed all of her work in her uh, record of professional learning. There are other ideas and examples of evidence that she could include her in her portfolio, and. Um, and you can refer again to that as a, a list of potential uh, pieces of evidence or documentation that could be included in a uh, record of professional learning. I just wanted to highlight that we also have three profiles and they're basically one uh, a single sheets of each profile sort of a, is a an, an imaginary RECE um, and uh, uh, a dem demonstrating one of their goals and uh, what they're opting to do to meet that goal. And then we have three portfolio examples and those are actually completed uh, portfolio components. So the self-assessment, the plan and the record of professional learning are completed for you to get an, an idea of how a member might fill them out. So um, again, those are available on the college's website as well. And so that wraps up um, our presentation on an introduction to the CPL portfolio. And um, I just want to emphasize again that much of the information that I've shared with you is available on the college's website. Uh, you can go directly to the CPL page on our homepage. Uh, we have a link uh, to the CPL homepage and we've provided it also in this uh, webinar for you as well. If you still have some questions following the uh, webinar, please do um, uh, touch base with us uh, at the college and we'd be more than happy to uh, respond to those questions. So thank you very much. Uh, merci beaucoup, miigwech.